Go. Oh, come on now. Yeah, we we did it. Quite a cost. <laughs> Thirty-five hundred bucks. Uh, yeah. So hopefully everybody read that story anyway. It was quite an advent. It was quite an adventure. Um, you know, um, one thing I gotta say is this. You know, I don't care where you go. The sharks are horrible right now. So you're just gonna you're gonna have to deal with those guys. But uh, no, like um, Todd said, for me, the blackfin fishery. This is a really, really cool fishery. And so a little bit of history about blackfins. You know, um, when I was a kid, we caught some, but nothing like we catch now. And then we went through a period, and things, there's always these anomalies in fishing. Um, so in 1985, we had Hurricane Elena. And I grew up fishing on the pier. Well. Back in the early late 70s and early 80s, when I was a kid fishing out there, we would catch one or two black fins, maybe five in a year. Um, and then Hurricane Elena happened. And there was always black fins, you know, a few miles offshore. Well, after that hurricane, there was ballyhoo all the way to the beach. There were schools of ballyhoo. And there was days we would catch 100 black fins off the pier. I've caught three in a day myself off the pier. Well, that lasted for 10 years. And then we had Hurricane Opal. And the black fins are still there. They're just a little further off. They're three or four miles off the beach. They don't come all the way. They still catch them at the pier, but you know, it's back to the five or six a year. The shark problem we're having, I think is the same way. We've always had sharks, but just not at the numbers and the as ferocious as they are right now. And I've noticed that the sharks have been way worse since Hurricane Michael. Yeah. Would you say about the yes. same thing? It's just that there, I mean, had we had, you know, we were out Friday fishing and we feel like we lost four groupers, four scamps, and five black we, to the sharks. It'd be, it was to the point where you could see the fish. And I mean, we were reeling as fast as I, I could and I'm still sore. <laughs> And I would I would reel on one for a little bit and then go here, Mark. You reel for just trying to just go as hard and as fast as we could, getting stuff up. And that fish would get about as close as you are and be eaten. But, but anyway, you know, this is what's neat about this fishery is is you know everybody's always talking about well I won't catch a tuna and a wahoo and a dolphin. Well, this is one of them offshore species we don't really have to go offshore for. I mean, the majority of the tunas that we catch are caught well within state waters, so you don't really have to go that far offshore. And it's one of the species that doesn't require so much specialized tackle. I just brought a couple of my rigs, but these are ones that we just use for when we're trolling for kings or we're bottom fishing. You know, they're just little Trinidad 30 reels. I think I got 65 braid on these. Your line doesn't need to be nearly that heavy for the black fins, but it's just stuff that that I use for other species, and I just make you know. So it's not something we have to go out and buy specialty rods and reels for. It's just it's all about just tackle. Um, and you know, I think most of what we're going to talk about tonight is trolling for the black fins. But the other day when we were hooking ours and catching the ones that we caught, we actually did that. Not trolling. And all we, about that? all we did was take one of my bottom rods, and you guys know I fish pretty light, but it was almost a set up very similar to this and just threw a couple live baits right off the back. Yeah. And I'd say that was probably the most consistent bite that we had for a while. Yeah. So we, we stopped bottom fishing to just focus on, I mean, and fishing doesn't really get any easier than that when you have a trolling motor but to drop a trolling motor and just drift some baits off the back and wait for a bite. And that's actually, when you were talking about mahi too, or dolphin, um, we went out looking for blackfin, what was that, maybe 10 days ago? And I hooked the bit, one of the biggest dolphin I've ever caught three miles off the beach while I was looking for tuna on a live cigar, well, actually on a jig. And it was such a big fish, we broke the hook off the jig. And then I happened to throw a cigar min off the back and we kept jigging for little chicken dolphin. And then all of a sudden that big line goes and I thought it was a king. And I look back and there's a 
I think we weighed it, I think it was 15, 16 pounds, but for state water, I mean, that's a, I think that's a pretty awesome fish for yeah. being three miles off of the beach. <coughs> so the big thing you gotta remember about this is, is not just open water, <coughs> just like everything else, we have to be fishing structure. And if you're fishing inshore, you know, some of the bigger places that we don't really typically think about fishing for anything else, they will hold a lot of tunas. Places like the Liberty Ship and the Miss Louise, um, any, any of that bigger structure that's gonna hold a tremendous amount of bait, that's one of the things that's gonna attract the tunas. If you have fads, that's even better yet because you have it to yourself and you don't have to fish around other people. But you know, when we were throwing out, when we were doing the live bait thing the other day, we're just using an owner Mutu Light 7 knot hook. The same thing that we would, the same hook basically we use for uh, snapper fishing, and then a uh, about a six foot fluorocarbon leader. Um, you know, for for anybody who doesn't know, you know, there's times to use fluorocarbon. There's times that we don't need to really spend the extra money on fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon was invented for the tuna fishery. You know, if you've paid attention to the tuna, they got a tremendous eye on them. They can see fantastic. So you need to have you know, it's one of those fisheries, this is one we need to have fluorocarbon. Um, and what's the worst that happens? You lose a king? Right. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna lose some hooks doing this because you're gonna get king mackerel bites. Um, Cause it's, but we're basically, everything that we're doing for tunas could and will work to catch king mackerels also. Or the cobia. Or the cobia. And we got our cobia that's on the leaderboard. We caught fishing for black fins the other day and we actually caught, we caught the one and there was another one swimming around that was at least twice, maybe three times as big. It was the it biggest cobia. There. If that was a cobia, it was the biggest cobia I've ever seen. Yeah, that was definitely cobia. That was not. That one was not a shark. He was way too dark. Um, so, um, I guess you know, kind of get into a little bit of what we know. My favorite things. I have three different rods rigged up, and these are the three that I would really troll with. And, you know. It's about covering some depths. We need to be able to look for some fish on the top, some fish at midwater, and some fish um, way down deep. So, you know, the rig that I would fish fur furthest away from the boat is this is my little bird rig right here. It's just got a cedar plug on it. And you can see there's a good amount of line. You know, I got 12 feet behind this little bird. With fluorocarbon, you know, normally like when we're fly lining, we use 60. I use 100 for this. We don't need 100 to be able to catch the black fin. But this is going to get to the end of the boat right here, and the tuna is still over there. And you're going to have to hand line that tuna the last little bit because this bird's going to get to the rod. So I use 100 just so it won't cut up my hands. But this is a great little rig. And this one we're gonna put way out behind the boat. And that little bird is just gonna sit there and go He's going across the top of the water. This is just an attractor. We sell these at the store. They come rigged and unrigged. The rigged one comes with a treble hook in it. I actually like the rigged one ease better because I can just cut the treble hook off and add a snap swivel to it and then just clip this leader to it. The unrigged one, you have to do everything, and it's a little bit of a pain to thread the monofilament through the bird. But that's just a, it's just a little catch-all rig. And then for storage, you know, hook the hook in the foot of one of the guides, wrap this big old long leader around your reel, and you're good to go. So pretty simple there. So that's the one that we have furthest back, and that one's going to be just on the surface. The next one is our, and, it, and, and you can use spinners or you can use conventional. It doesn't really matter. This one, I just have a deep dive in Yozuri on it. And so this, so this one by itself will probably only run about six or eight feet deep. But this one's running, this is the next furthest thing away from the boat, and just a little Yozuri lure. And then, uh-oh, uh -oh. 
Lost my microphone. Is my is my deep running rig. And this one, just like the little bird, it has a planer on it. Now, same thing, super long leader to get my lure away from the planer. For those of you that have not fished with a planer, these are simple. They've been this has been around for 50 years when, since I was a kid. You want to let it out in that position right there. When we get it to where we want it to go, this planer is going to run about 20 feet deep, this size. This is a number two. When we get it to where we want it, you're going to pick the rod up and throw slack in it. When you do, that little it's going to hit like this, and the water hitting the face of this is what's going to drive it deep. As soon as the fish hits it, he doesn't have to hit it very hard. It will release. And it comes to the top and it's just a whee. So planers are super easy to use. If, it, if you have it set, it, and it's, it is going to tug really hard. I mean, this rod is going to be in the rod holder doing this. If you want to get it unset, the same way we set it, pick it up, throw slack in it, and that planer will unset, and you can reel it in real easy. So that trolling the trolling technique is super, super easy. When you go to store this, the planer, I like it to end up down here pretty close to the reel. So it's not beating on the rod. It'll be right here up against this rubber part. Working backwards. And you can put a lot of different, you know, I like cedar plugs and Yozuri's and Rapala's, but pretty much anything will run behind this planer or behind the bird, the little Williamson lures, any kind of small feathers, the little islanders right there, they all work really good whether it's behind the bird or behind the planer. You run them by themselves? Yes. Um, and so that, you know, the, the lure trolling is the easiest way to locate the fish and cover a lot of territory if we have to fish several places. You know, once you locate the fish, there's several methods after that. To, if you don't want to catch them trolling, you know, I know Mark, he loves throwing lures and stuff. So how about tell us about poppers and jigs for well, tuners? If you can find them or if you know where they are, I think there's just something. I like to set the hook. I like that there's a, I can't say it on the microphone or on camera, but there's a moment that I look for in every one of my trips where somebody looks at me and it's like, I need some, I need help. And I, that's kind of a thing that we go for when we fish on our really light gear, but there's just something, especially on top water too, if you know they're around. And, and I feel like almost every fish, if you look at it, they're dark on the back and white on the belly. And that's just, thousands or millions of years of evolution. So if you're looking down, you can't see them. And you, if you're looking up, you can't see them. But like Tim said, tuna have that huge eye. And I feel like they normally feed coming up. And if you can throw a top water plug, that fish would probably come out of the water when it hits. And that's that moment that I'm looking for where somebody's like, like our buddy the other day when he, sorry. Well, you know, like Todd was talking about, he saw him busting out there. I would always have a spinning rod rigged up and ready with either a popper or a jig on it. I actually like the popper because like Mark said, all of a sudden you're, you, you could be trolling along and all of a sudden the, they're just busting right here beside the boat. You can grab that popper, throw it, just boom, boom, boom. And it's pretty much you're popping as hard and as fast as you can go. And there's just, it's like somebody just flushed a toilet right there. Just boom. And we've had, to, and it, especially the bonita, because I mean, when you see them, they're probably bonita on the surface, but we've had two bonita on one of these, one on each hook, which we thought, I thought was a king, by the way, it was pulling, because this was the middle of summer, but to have two bonita pulling on one hook was, is pretty fun. And that's what, I, I always say the same thing every, every time, I'm like, it's supposed to be fun. 
and I don't care if, I mean, if you hook anything on top water at the end of the day, you're probably like, oh, that's pretty fun. And if it, especially if it's a tuna. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I like to do. Yeah. And then of course, you know, we have the little hex head jigs and little spoons. There again, sometimes they're not biting a big popper. Sometimes, especially uh, late in the day, they're going to be chasing them little schools, a little baby glass minnows. You catch one, and they'll throw it, them little glass minnows all over the boat. And it, it too, when you get back to the dock, I'm always curious to see what they're feeding. Especially, we had a, a and I, I use bonita for bait for just about <laughs> everything. But the other day, we had these bonita, and when I was filling it up for bait, his stomach had to have been this big around. And I was like, what's he been eating? And when I pop that open, I'll show you a picture of it on my phone. It was pretty horrific. I want to say, what, 200 glass minnows came out of his belly? So you're absolutely right. I mean, if they're feeding on glass minnows, they're probably going to look at this and go, I don't know what the hell that is. So, you know, sometimes you have to have something littler to throw at them. And especially with those mahi, like I... A lot of the mahi that, or those little chicken dolphin that we've been catching have all been on super small jigs. And if I see them, especially, I mean, you know, you've seen them just swim up to the boat and you're like, well, uh, and if you're throwing top water and they're not hitting, I always, and I, I've started to cut up my bonita chunks at the end of the day and just put them all in individual bags and leave a bag out to thaw. But you cut up the bonita chunks? You cut some once. But twice since I've known you. I've seen you cut it twice. But every single other day. Um, but I keep them in a, actually, and I'll tell you guys this too, the best thing, one of the best things I ever made for my boat, it wasn't even my idea. It was just a stick with a, like a dog ball on top. Um, and then it's kind of evolved into a little bit fancier of a PVC pipe with a bowl with a lid. But it's the best thing that I've ever had for bait. I put that right in the rocket launcher, right behind my seat. And if I, yeah, if I get to, yeah, if you put a little, exactly, just like that. And I put it right there in the seat. If, if mahi swim to the boat, I grab a handful of my stuff, I throw it out. If they're eating it, then I'll probably throw some on a hook and throw that out there and catch the first one. If I throw out a handful of bait and they don't want it, I don't care how long you stay or how many different things you throw, they're not gonna eat. And you, you get mad at me every time I see that. But now it's kind of like if I have my little dog bowl of cut beneath chunks and throw that out. Um, but I use this a lot. Little little things, single hooks, and then different kind of jigs for, for everything. But what about, speaking of throwing baits into the water or chunks of bonita into the water, you ever chum? So... Um one of my favorite things to do for the black fins, now this takes a little bit of work, but there are days when you want to go out there and some days they're not going to bite troll and you're going to see a bunch of them. They're not biting. You're going to try live bait and they're not going to bite. But one method that's always been almost surefire for me is you're leaving Legendary or wherever and you're going towards the pass and there's the schools of the little baby menhaden in the bay. Well, you need to stop get your cast net out, fill one, fill one of the live wells full of them little menhaden and a five gallon bucket full. They're real easy to catch. Sometimes one or two throws with the cast net is 10 gallons of them. Well, you get out there over whatever, you can be over natural bottom, you could be in the 18s or the timber holes or the Nicky grounds or out there around White Hill. Take a handful of dead ones, throw them out. And I'm sure anybody who's watched Wicked Tuna this is the same thing that they're doing for yellow fins. We do it for black fins. Or, um, but just take a little scoop net and throw about half a dozen of them little live ones over. And the dead ones will float down and the live ones will disperse away. And then you wait a few minutes, throw another handful of dead ones over, another scoop of six or so live ones out there. And the, live, you know, the dead ones, you can kind of watch them. They're just slowly kind of drift away as you're holding up with either your motors or your trolling motor or if you're anchored, and they're just slowly going out. And the live ones, they just kind of disperse out. You, you, they're, they're just not around. And then all of a sudden, and then you're going to take one live one, just put it on a hook, 
just pitch him out there and kind of let him just sit there and just peel the line out real slow so he'll kind of go out with the same rate of speed that the dead ones are sinking. And then all of a sudden, all them live ones that you threw out, they're going to go and they're all right there behind the boat. Well, you better hold on because you're about to get bit. Because the tuna, all of a sudden, they'll just bust right there at the boat, hit all them little live ones. That, to me, that's another super, super fun way of catching them. And like I say, it'll work over wrecks, it'll work over natural bottom, it works if you have fads, um, pretty much any way. It's fun, it's especially when you get into big schools of bait or like you said, sitting on a fad or something, when you see all that bait in the water and there's just thousands, millions of them, and then all of a sudden they're gone. It's just the coolest thing. And you can do it with um, either five pound boxes of frozen herring or five pound boxes of menhaden and cut them into little chunks, but it's not quite the same as when you actually have the little live menhaden and actually have live ones. We actually have frozen little menhaden right now. We don't always have them. The shrimp guys get them for us whenever they can, but we actually have little packages of frozen menhaden or LYs at the shop right now. But any of that, um, you know, bonita chunks would work. Um, I'd be careful throwing too much bonita in the water, though. This is true. You're going to try, you know, you are going to track some sharks, and they're already bad, so. Um, how long, if you, if you do start throwing stuff in there, how long would you wait on a spot before moving? Uh, I'd probably jump for at least 30 minutes before I decided to go to the next place. Because it may take you, a, you know, if they're a mile away, it's going to take some amount of time to attract them over to where you're at. Uh, but there's enough of them in shore right now. I don't, think it, I don't think you should have to chum more than 30 minutes anywhere to get them up by the boat. Not that this is a Q&A session of me asking you questions, but this hit home to me on Friday. How much drag do you like to fish your tuna with? Not nearly as much as some of my <laughs> friends. <laughs> You know, they have a tough mouth. They got, there is, you know, it, it's pretty hard to pull the hook once you get one hooked. But we busted one off, and I'm, I'm like, how much drag? I mean, how did, we got 65 pound braid, and we break off a black film. I'm like, how does that happen? And I walk over there, and somebody's got like grouper drag on this thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. Well, we also had sharks eating tunas off the boat, too, so. It, you know, if you put it on a scale and actually pull the drag, you know, you're reading all these magazines how much how pounds of drag a reel will get. Six or eight pounds of drag on a spinning rod is a tremendous amount of drag. Um, I don't think you need more than six pounds of drag, especially, you know, if it's a conventional reel, and I need a little bit more extra drag. If he's going too much, I, got, I can put my thumb right here on the spool and stop him. It's not like a grouper that I have to worry about getting in a wreck. He's just running away from me. So I can put my thumb on top of this spool. I can slow him down. If it's a spinning rod, I can just grab the spool and just kind of hold on to it. Even with one finger, I can almost stop a spinning reel spool. So six pounds of drag is more than sufficient. Um, because you're not going to just, you're not going to take a 25 pound tuna and just drag him to the boat. He's got too much power for that. Um, so you're going to have to let him run and fight and you're going to get some line back and he's going to run off again. And that's going to happen two or three times. And you know, you can tell pretty quick, um, if it's a bonita or a tuna, a bonita, he's going to run and go, He's going to run and do that little shaky, shake, shake, and he's going to run and do that again. A tuna is going to run, stop, then he's going to run over here, he's going to run over here, and he's going to go deep. And, you know, the bonitas will pull down a little bit, but the tuna, he's going to run down, he's going to death spiral. And then once you get him on death spiral, now you can start putting some heat on him to try to get him up from the sharks. But in, while he's still running, you're going to have to let him run. Um, and, you know, um, as far as, to me, edibility of tunas. So we got the rodeo and we're going to eat tunas. So this is, 
This is hard for me. So I lived in, well, I spent a lot of time in Japan, and I prepared tuna a lot of different ways. I've eaten handfuls of tuna on the docks in Japan, and I tuna fish, and I can show you pictures of what Kayla's made for the last five days um, on the tuna we've been eating. It's awesome. I like to bleed my tuna out, and I also like to bleed bonita out because I really think you could eat bonita. Um, and everybody can laugh at me for that, but I don't think you'd be able to tell much of a difference if you did it the right way. Um, but that being said, you have to nail it, and if you don't nail it, it'll taste like rust. Um, so I don't normally recommend it. But the blackfin, I like to, as soon as I get them, it's called the Ikejimi type method of bleeding them out. And what I like to do is cut the gills and a ring around the tail and stand it on its head in a bucket of like an icy slush water. And it's amazing. I mean, the heart will keep pumping blood and it'll just pump all the blood straight out of his body. Um, and it's amazing. It'll fill up a five gallon bucket in 30 seconds with blood. It's crazy how much comes out of these things. Um, the full real way to do it is to slide a wire or some kind of spike down its spinal column, which is really difficult to do, especially on a 20-foot boat in four-foot seas. Um, but I think bleeding it out regularly goes a long way. And then I'll gut it and pack it full of ice and throw it in my cooler, um, unless we're weighing it in for the rodeo, at which point I won't gaff it. I won't, <laughs> I won't do anything weird at all, and he'll go straight into the cooler, and I won't cut him open at all until we get home. Yeah. So that was when I was saying, you know, this is the one you got to decide what you're going to do. If you're rodeo fishing, you know, um, Some, so, uh, sometimes with Mark's way of bleeding, I take mine, I lift their peck fin up and cut them underneath the peck fin because their carotid artery goes right there. They'll bleed out real fast that way. But, you know, if you're rodeo fishing and you bleed that tune out. You just lost some significant weight. So the ones that we were weighing in the other day, you know, it's more of a pain to dip net them, but we're dip netting the tunas for the rodeo. And sometimes I'll use these, especially on charter, because it's, if I'm by myself and I've got four people on the boat, I can't really have a kid on, I mean, if a kid's on the rod and I'm on the net, that's one thing, but a lot of times too, if once I can get that leader pretty good, and that fish is in his little spiral, and if I can get him good with a glove or something on, if I can get him in the lip, or even some fish like a cobia, like a cobia will freak out, but if he's undersized and you wanna to try to get that hook out or something anyway, sometimes, I mean, a little, an extra hook, he's already got a hook in his lip. If you can get an extra hook in him just to get the other hook out, you know, these go a long way. I think I've got at least three of these on my boat. Yep. On every corner. But, you know, so like I say, if you're going to fish the rodeo, you definitely need, need to be netting those fish because, you know, our tunas, um, the winners in the rodeo are going to be are in that 26 to 27, 25 to 27 pound range. And if you bleed a 25 pounder out, he becomes 23 pounds real fast. So you can just forget about that one. It's one of those species, they only get so big and we catch some of the biggest black fins in the state. So they're, everybody's going to be right there at the same size, and we're all fighting for those extra couple of ounces. Plus, from a food perspective, I mean, your tunas are probably this long, and it's the meat is probably 80% of that fish. And what are the odds you're going to gaff it in the head? You're probably going to stick that gaff right into the middle of the meat, and you're going to find that later when you're filleting it. Yep. So, you know, you just have to make that decision, I guess. Do you really want to be, you know, and... It, they're kind of a little bit hard to tell in the water. Okay, is this an 18-pounder or is this a 27-pounder? There's not, there's not a lot of difference in length. You know, an 18-pounder is this big and a 27-pounder is this big. But there's about how fat they are. Um, you know, if I was just strictly catching them to eat and I wasn't worried about the rodeo, bleed them out as soon as, I mean, the second he gets in the boat, get him cut. How many people are in the rodeo? Okay, we got some. Why isn't everybody else in the rodeo? Those are, those are going to be the guys who catch the big one, too. You know, um, the rodeo, 
is about, you know, it is a fishing tournament, but it's about, it's a fun tournament too. Anybody who's not fishing in it, you should really look into it. It's, it's huge for the community. You know, the TD, the numbers vary from the TDC to the city of Destin, but the Destin Fish and Rodeo generates somewhere between 25 and $30 million for the economy over the course of 30 days. And most of the, a lot of the tournaments are super, super competitive. You know, they don't have a lot of places to weigh your fish. They're expensive to get in. The Destin Fish and Rodeo is a couple hundred bucks. Um, if you win one first place, you've won your money back. There's 180 places on the big board. There's places for charter, charter 25 and under, private, private 25 and under, party boat, seniors, ladies, juniors, pier, pier bridge, surf, kayak. I mean, there's just so many places to put fish on the board. Plus, and it's really cool to pull up. I mean, even if you're not in it, that's what we were just talking about, just to go to AJ's and watch weigh-ins. Yeah. And even for me, like, I go fishing as often as I can. It's, I love it. But when I'm not fishing, I think we did at least twice last year, and I live all the way over in Grayton Beach, but from me and Kayla drove down to AJ's just to watch all the boats come in and weigh in stuff because I'm on a 21-foot boat. My fishing's a little different than some of the guys, but what was that Mako that came in last year? I mean, it's still cool for me to sit back and be a little kid again and look at the, the some of these bigger boats and these big guys catching some pretty cool fish. Plus, there's always live music and... Yeah, and just drinks. Kidding, especially if you got kids on board, you know, um, we, our junior division. You bring a kid brings a fish that weighs one pound or more. He's going to get a certificate that he caught this fish. He's going to get his picture made with Miss Destin, and he's going to get a little fishing rod and reel. If he weighs a fish that weighs more than a pound, we have never had a kid bring a fish to the dock that did not weigh a pound. I mean, we put us. We've had kids come up there. Got basically got us. They got a pin fish. A cigar minnow. Well, 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 that pin fish. He goes in a Ziploc bag, and we fill the bag with water, and we weigh the bag, <laughs> water, fish, and all. It's going to. I mean, if a little, if a little guy or girl this big brings a fish to the dock, their fish gonna weigh a pound. So if you got grandkids or your own kids, and you want to get them into fishing, it's a super way to get into it. Get real excited to get there get on the dock and get their picture made with Miss Dustin, get their little certificate and their little fishing pole. Um, great way to get kids into fishing. Um, so we, you know, we want to see everybody down at the rodeo. I've got two new questions for you. All right. What about vertical jigging? So I have had real good success vertical jigging tunas. I've never been very successful jigging them in shallow water. We get out there in over 200 feet. If you're fishing, you know, if you're out there bottom fishing the lead, you know, at the southwest edge or somewhere out there in the deeper water, you know, um, I think vertical jigging is very effective for them. But while I've done real good jigging for snapper in 70 feet of water, mm -hmm. I've almost caught no tunas vertical jigging in shallow water. Maybe. I don't know the right technique. There might be three or four of y'all out here that say, oh no, we kill them vertical jigging in that shallow water. But I haven't had much success with it. In deep water, I've done real good. I mean, you can go to the fads and kill them that way, or the rigs. What about on your, I'm just thinking of questions where I was sitting, and I literally, when I moved down here, I sat in every one of these seats that you you guys are sitting in. I've, and Kayla, Kayla and I actually sat in a boat for a couple of them just to, Made yeah. Um, what when you're throwing a flat line off the back, um, and I think for us on Friday, a lot of our tunas came off. I mean, all of them came off the flat line while we were on a spot that we were trying to bottom fish. Yeah. When you tie your flat line off the bat, uh, like you were saying earlier, you have wires for king and stinger rigs. How do you go from your main line to whatever you're fishing with for tuna? So I'm pretty much on all my, all my rods have braid. So I don't like going braid to a leader because that seems to tangle real bad. So every, if you come up and look at any of mine, they're gonna have a top shot of mono, just 25 feet or so. And that's tied with an FG knot. 
so it'll reel into the reel very easy. And then I just put a snap swivel at the end of that, and then my tuna leader is just six feet long, and it has a swivel and a hook. And that 60, that, you know, my, the wind on may be much heavier, but my leader for the actual tuna, for the live bait on the tuna is just 60 pound mono. And I just use a standard seven knot owner Mutu light hook. No. Is there a certain you know, bait you prefer when you're flatlining? If I have my choice, my, my number one bait for almost everything is live herring. Um, but we didn't, you know, the other day we bought, we bought bait the other day and the bait boys had, they had caught cigar minas that day. So cigar minas work just fine, but not, and my, nothing's better than live herring. Where do you hook them? I hook mine right in front of the eyeballs. I don't go in the eye socket, but just right in front of it. There's a little hard place right there where you can push it through and they stay on real good. If you hook them through, the cigar minas you can hook through the eyes, they won't come off too much. But herring are so soft in between their eyes, half the time you'll throw the herring off when you go to flip it out behind the back of the boat. And you guys can stop me and ask your own questions if you want, but I'm just running through what I would have wanted to know. All right, say so you're trolling these three rods off the back and you get a hit on one of them and you're driving the boat, then what do you do? So most of the time fish is going to run away from you first, so I just keep going straight. At that point, whichever way the fish goes, I turn into the fish. So I got him on the inside and I leave the, the other two rods going and I try to keep the fish inside this circle because if you if you'll keep going most of the time the others will get bit as the fish if you once you've been five minutes into this battle you can reel the other rods in and get them out of your way but when you first get that hit don't just immediately reel the other two in if you'll make one or two more circles while you're fighting that fish a lot of times you'll pick up a second or third bonita you might or tuna you might have three on at a time then you're in trouble <laughs> Knit one pearl too. <laughs> Jeez. I have a question. How far out do you guys think you have, like, do you have to be in the 300 foot of water to catch a tuna right now? Or what, what distance are you seeing it be appropriate to look for or try to find one? I know a lot of the charter boats that, surprisingly, yesterday, I went down to the dock, rodeo dock about 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon and they absolutely just crushed the king mackerels and the tunas. Most of them didn't go out until 10 o'clock when the thunderstorms quit and they were back at three. Most of the fish yesterday were well within nine miles. You know, because those people, most of those boats didn't fish but four hour trips yesterday. So you definitely don't have to go that far to catch them right now. It's not like you gotta go 20 miles the Liberty ship, the pole spot, the Miss Louise, like the Miss Louise 70 is, it's in what, 75 feet of water, three quarters of a mile from the beach. Do you guys recommend that it's, it's gonna be a wreck that we're looking for, or? Wreck or natural bottom, either one. And if you really, um, and, and you can catch them throughout the day. I mean, you, the, the, you can actually get bites all day long. The prime time is 30 minutes before the sun comes up for about two hours after the sun comes up, and then from two hours before dark till 30 minutes after. That is the prime time. And if we're on a full moon from 11 to 1, but that, early 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 morning late you can get off work at four o'clock and you can have a chance to catch three tunas and be and be back home at dark and that will last the longest that i've ever seen the tuna run last um <coughs> one of the years when we were catching them on the pier we had had the weather had stayed pretty nice all the way up into december and it was December 21st, and it had been about 75 degrees the day before. And on the 21st, that night, we had a big storm come through, and we went to the pier that morning, and it is screaming from the north, blowing 30 knots. It was about 35 degrees. 
the bait was all over the top of the water, and it was me and two of my buddies, and we were able to walk out there. You could drop a treble hook in the water and just snag a bait and throw it off the end of the pier, and it would hit the water and go, and you would have a tune on. But we caught them. We probably all had three that morning. That's the latest I've ever seen them. Typically, by about the second week of December, they're done. A lot of times, the tuna fishing is better in November than it is in October. They, you know, while the dolphin, as we get these cold fronts, one more cold front, dolphin fishing's over. But each cold front, the tuna fishing will get better and better and better. Same way with the king mackerel. Um, we all think about October as this big king mackerel time. Well, there, and I know a lot of people that say that I invented live bait king mackerel fishing in Dustin. Well, I've been here, I fished here since the 70s, and there was a guy that I remember, um, his name was Mike Sabo. He's kind of a crazy old guy, but he's the one that, that I really remember getting the live bait thing going for King Mackerel. And there's a picture in Harbor Docks of a catch he had. He, he charter fished and he commercial fished. He has the single best catch of King Mackerel that I have ever seen. And if I remember right, the picture is dated November the 13th. He had 13 king mackerel. He didn't have a fish, and he fished by himself. He did not have a fish under 48 pounds. He had five over 60. Single best catch of king mackerel I've ever seen anywhere. It was happened, and it happened here in Destin with a guy fishing by himself. And that was in November. So the fish, you know, just because the rodeo's over on October 31st, don't think that this is all over with. So are you saying that the same areas that you'd target tuna, you'd target king mackerel? Yes. And right now, dolphin? Mm-hmm. For one or two more cold fronts. <laughs> just I'm hoping that they're everywhere. I hope that cold front doesn't come. Absolutely. With the exception, if the bonitas are jumping and busting and they're hit over here and hit over here and do this mess and they're all they're just everywhere, absolutely. If you see those big round schools of bonitas and are going side by side by side by side, those are spawning. Just drive on. You can throw till you're blue in the face. You can sit there for five hours. If they're all going side by side by side by side, you're not catching one because they're not interested in what you got. They got something else on their mind. <laughs> I mean, how would you target tuna and and just get away from the bonita in that situation? You're not. You're gonna have to weed through <laughs> every single Friday. bonita before you find that tuna. We caught Friday. We were catching three three bonita per one tuna. That was about that was about our average. And like you said, I mean, as soon as you could as for me, normally I'm driving the boat, and if you're doing your thing, and we had an angler angling, and when you're watching it, you're looking at the rod, and you're like, what is it? And like, I think you and I kind of know what it is based on how it's fighting, but somebody who's not used to it, you're like, is it a tuna or is it a bonita? And I just stare at the rod tip. When I, you see that rod tip start going like this, you're like, eh, don't even worry about that. I don't know what that is. But... I think that was the biggest thing for us on Friday is just seeing what he was trying to fight. Yeah. And it was most of the time I would I was sitting there and I was just taking the rod and just throwing it out. And sometimes I'd stick it in the rod holder and bottom fish, but most of the time I could just throw it out there and just like Kevin. <laughs> take another one, throw it out there, and it it wasn't taking very long. Once we got to the once we found, you know, they weren't, I don't think they were on the first spot we went to, but they were at the second spot we went to. And once we found them, it was easy. Did the Janet give a Mm-hmm. Yep. Any of those big wrecks. If it's holding a lot of bait, there's a good chance the black fins, if they're not there when you get there, they'll be there shortly. When you say holding bait, do you mean surface bait? You mean bait on the bottom? You mean 
I mean, how, what about reading your sonar? How can you use your sonar to help figure out? So long as you, you so long as you have bait, it I don't care if it, I don't really care if the bait's way up on the surface or in the mid column. So long as there's bait, if you can drop a sabiki rig down there and catch some sort of herring, cigar minna, thread fin, hardtail, if you can catch it on a sabiki rig, that's good enough bait. Anywhere the bait's hanging out, as long as there's food. So say you find a big school or shoal of bait, are you going to put your trolling motor down or the helm master right in the middle of that bait? You're going to drift your bait back on the edge of that school of bait? I'm going to put my, I want to put my trolling motor down and be able to pitch. I want my bait, I want to be able to throw my bait. If the bait school, or if the people of the bait school, I want my bait past them on the outside so when the tunas come in they find mine first the one thing that i noticed a lot right and i know we're talking about tuna but the one bite that i noticed differently the past month i throw a lot of metal jigs and you guys have heard me talk about that a lot normally i can cast them out normally when i throw it out i'll let it sink to the bottom i'll rip it back up about halfway let it sink to the bottom and rip it back up to the boat. That's how I fish my metals on, on our spots. Um, I went out with a guy on fly rods because we swore I was catching kings so consistently on jigs. I was like, we can catch a king on a fly. So we went out there and we did, which was awesome. But we found out the hard way. I kept pitching my jig out and letting it sink to the bottom. And he'd be fighting a bonita or something so i just put my rod in a rod holder go over help him out come back start reeling mine in my jig was gone so cast it out again let it sink to the bottom did something over here came back got it started ripping it back my jig was gone and i found out that day every single bite we had was on the fall so i don't know if uh, the fish they're looking up all the time they're, they feed up watching that big shoal of bait and that one bait fluttering down injured wounded next to them but every single fish that we caught for about three weeks there was all on the fall yeah. on on the jig wow and that's the hardest i mean you can't really feel that strike so that's a that was one thing that really stuck out to me with my little my weird method of jigging <laughs> But I think almost any kind of, you know, even trout, redfish, and everything else, I think you catch a lot of fish on the fall. I mean, that's, you, you're going to get more bites on the fall than you are on the upstroke. Questions? Yes, sir. Does tide matter? Do tides come in or Only if you're fishing right there around the sea buoy. If the tide's pouring out and you have that big tide line sitting there in the afternoon, Sometimes that tide line can be really, really good. Um, but, in, in, but it does, if you're 10 miles from the pass, the tide doesn't mean anything. Yes, sir. Back to the, the, the legal age for considered a child is 12? Junior angler is 12 and under. Yes, sir. What type of knot did you say that you were tying in one for, for my top shot, I use an FG knot. Some people use uni to uni. Um, I used to use an Albright. An Albright. The, until he actually showed me one. There's one on YouTube. It was, I find it when I look up the reverse FG. Yeah. And you did a demonstration of that one night. That's what I tie a reverse FG. Most people work from the mono in, and I work from the braid in. I found the video on YouTube, and I was... I had a lot of trouble tying an FG till I figured out how to tie it in reverse. You don't have to have any tension on it. I'll, sh I'll show you after. Yeah. Y'all got to have more questions. How fast are you trolling? Um, King Michael speed, four or five miles an hour. So y'all think y'all can go catch one tomorrow? Actually, it's going to be a little rough tomorrow. How about Thursday or Friday? Yeah. Fr Friday and Saturday look like good days so far. So, I mean, I, several people asked me earlier, um, 
you know, uh, about red snapper. You know, of course, the federal boats have gotten some, they've gotten about 20 red snapper days. I keep, we're getting phone calls and stuff at the shop. What do you think we're going to get for state waters? Um, we won't know, and we probably won't know until the morning of the 8th. The meetings are the 6th and 7th. Um, and I don't, I don't think we'll hear anything on the 7th. What I expect, what I think the least I expect us to get on Snapper are Friday, Saturday, Sunday for three weekends. Um, probably starting the same weekend that the federal boats get. And if anybody has the question as why the federal boats get more days than we do at recreational, they do a much better job of counting their fish. They, they report every single fish they catch every day they got. So they have better accountability and on the state guide boat and recreational side, we have no accountability. And until we count our fish and give them true fish counts, we are gonna be on the short end of that stick. We have, you know, y'all need to go to your, and there's several different ways that we can do it. My theory is we need an app. That's, and every morning you go fishing, you're gonna log into the app and you get to the sea buoy, it's too rough to go fishing. Well, hey, we had four guys, we got to the buoy, we couldn't go fish because it was too rough and you sign out of your app and go home. And then if you go fishing, you're signed into your app. And if you get caught offshore and you're not signed into your app, there needs to be a pretty stiff penalty. Um, and then when if, and on your way in, you're gonna log your catch and you're gonna say we caught, we had six people on the boat today, we caught three groupers, two scamp, four king mackerels, five snapper, whatever. And if you get checked at the dock and your fish don't match what's in that app, you get a significant fine. When I say a significant fine, it needs to be something to hurt somebody's wallet. And we got and there's more than, that's just one method that I came up with, but we have to have a method to count our fish. Because right now, my, somebody asked me earlier, my buddy Corey lives in, in Tennessee. Well, he bought a fishing license this year. And he intended on coming and going snapper fishing a couple of times. Well, as it worked out, he never got to come. But in the eyes of the feds and the state, he had a fishing license. We had 44 days of snapper. He caught 88 snappers because we have no way to count them. But I do expect us to get some days. Sorry, I'm just staring at the table here, not to change the subject. Is there a color you prefer? Pink, pink, or pink. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I, I just wanted to hear you say that. Yeah, pretty much it's pink, pink, or pink. But that's, I mean, I feel like that can be said for any species. Most any species. I mean, pink is my number one, is my favorite color. Pink, red, and white. Um, Tuna is definitely is a pink thing. And things change so fast, so I, I feel like I want to reiterate a thing I've been doing a lot. When I get to the table, I look and see what that fish has been eating. And then I think, if, especially if it's a rain minnow, then I know exactly what I'm going to throw. I'm going to throw my little jigs anyway. Um, but I just like to... Twirly thingy? Can we get a twirly thingy? It goes a long way when you can look and see what your fish has been eating so you know what to throw. If you're throwing... If you're throwing jigs. Okay, so you got the little tickets. Do you guys have any questions on... I think I was kind of, I kind of took your spot and asked as many questions as I could think of. You asked the right questions. Were they any good? I thought, I didn't know if that was going to be annoying or not. Yeah, I like it. You know what to ask. How far behind are you trolling? So the one with the bird on it? The minimum distance is the door. But maybe that far again. And then the then the other rod, the, the medium rod, probably it can be at the blue boat, the light blue boat. And then the planer rod, the planer can be going in the water about where those trolling motors are. Are those, that big 425 right there. So we're covering a lot of water that way and a lot of water that way. 
But the tuna, the thing about the bird rig is sometimes tunas are very, very, very picky. And if you have that bird rig just running halfway across the building, you'll see them busting back there beside it, but they won't eat it. How do, how do you choose if you want the big bird or the little bird? I just, how much you want to spend at half inch? I, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I try one, if I'm not getting one, bites on one, I go to, you know, it's, it's kind of that search and peck thing every morning. We gotta find the right size and color for the day. If you have one uh, out of your three rod spread here, if you find that all the hits are coming off the same one, are you gonna adjust the other two? I've been known to do that. I think, you know, and in, in every day is gonna be different, but a lot of days you'll find the planer rod might get bit first, and it'll get bit, and it comes up to the surface, and the other two rods go off. Normally, if they bite the flat line, they're not going to bite the planer line. But if they bite the planer line, they'll hit the medium rod, then they'll hit the bird, because they'll all come up, but they're not gonna go back down. So, I've noticed you've got, you brought top waters, some crankbaits, have you ever tried throwing a cedar plug into a ball of fish, a boil of fish? I would rather have the concave head of the popper so I can make more racket with it. Have you ever, t I, you have painted ones, but what about the wood colored, the originals? The original is the best color. It's the hardest to get people to buy. It's my favorite, and there's a big study that I read when I was in Japan on why, because that's, the wood colored one looks pink in the water. Well, turn, when you get it red, when you get it wet, it's that color. And that wood one, I'm not saying that this is one of my favorite things to do, but if you leave that wooden one in your bag of bait or in a pack of gulp and it absorbs all the stink in that, it helps. I never told you that. <laughs> because we don't, uh, I, I don't really troll, so. We need to give away some hats. Let's give away some hats. Did everybody fill out the? I could tell a story that can take two minutes that I think you posted on Facebook without my blessing. <laughs> you got a lot of hits. Did it? Did you guys hear about that? Over 5,000 hits. We were fishing, yeah. When's the cutoff to get Seven o'clock at night. But you can get in line, as yeah. long if there's a line, as long as you're in line and check in with the, what do they call it, the dock master? Yeah, as long as you check in with the harbor master. The harbor master? Harbor master, dock master. If there's a line, as long as he sees you, and especially if you let him know your charter, you get priority too, because you've probably got people on the boat that are trying to get home. Um, so that's good. But yeah, it's 7 o'clock at night. And, and last year, I believe on October 31st at 6.59, there were a lot of boats Pulling in. So it is. We don't have a sponsor, and we don't have accommodations for it. The likelihood of us adding it to the rodeo is pretty slim. More than anything. Um, I've been on the board of directors for 25 years. This is one thing that I'm adamant about, is I believe that the fisheries should be equal. Everybody should have an equal opportunity. So let's say, let's look at, I'm going to use from the charter boat perspective. The federal boats are going to get 15 days in October, but if they only open it up in state waters for Friday, Saturday, Sundays, the state guide boats could not fish other days. And then by us having a category for it, we would be pushing business 
to the federal boats. We want to support all of the boats and from that perspective on the charter boats, we want to be able to equally distribute the business. It's like so unless it's open, so we, our rule in the rodeo has always been, it's either, if it's not open for everybody, it's not open for anybody. Because last year they opened state water red snapper, but not federal. Correct. So you didn't open it because I could keep them, but federal wouldn't. Right. And the rodeo thought that people would want to take a state boat instead of federal because they were allowed to keep red snapper. So I will never. Which I was okay with. You know, I'll never <laughs> vote to have it to where it only benefits one sector. You can still go catch them. It's just not a fish in the rodeo. <laughs> Plus, this time of year, I feel like there's more and more mingos that have moved in. And I think mingos taste a little bit better than red snapper anyway. Yep. And how about the size of those whites from Friday? Oh, uh, I don't know why. You, uh, those are just bait, but you know, whatever. I, I, like, I like white snappers, those porgies. I think they taste just as good as a mingo. Do you think they're great? Is that what you said? Oh, yeah. Thank you. And the ones, I mean, they were, they were the biggest ones I've ever seen. And Tim was like, I don't know, throw. I don't tell anybody that, but they're great. Tim's like, yeah, throw those back. We don't want those. I was like, oh, okay, I'll throw them over here in my cooler. <laughs> Nasty. All right, hats, what do we have? I think we have five or six drawings. Five, four. Four? Four. Do you bring an extra mold? I brought two of my jigs. Okay. But yep. I have to have, yeah, sure. All right. I brought two of mine just because. Just because. All right, okay, first of all, just before we do any kind of giveaway, just so everybody knows, and first of all, if you guys have not met, met Sarah, this is Sarah. She is the beautiful marketing manager here for Legendary Marine, and she puts together all of these big events and things that are going on. She's actually the one that ordered, ordered the specific pieces tonight, so the fact that you guys got different options besides pepperoni, thank you. That was huge. That was great. <laughs> so um, we wanted to let you guys know that there is going to be an event it's Friday and Saturday. Um, it is going to be the uh, Scout 530 LXF christening on Friday, and this is going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, outside of that, you guys are scheduling sea trials. If anybody wants to come and hop on the boat and just check it out, and I mean, just go on, I mean, go on a boat ride, you know, just, just figure it out and which, see, which see all of the technology, everything. See Miss Sarah, she will get you signed up as far as um, appointments for that. But definitely, if you're here at 10 o'clock on Friday, you'll be able to be a part of the whole celebration for the unveiling. Um, and we're really excited about that. And, so. and Friday's supposed to be actually a nice day. Yes, it's supposed to be gorgeous. So come see Sarah if you want to schedule an appointment. Otherwise, be here Friday at 10 a.m. and just check out all of the cool things going on with it. And they'll give you more details on all of that as well. So. Austin. Well, I want to bring down Abby here. Miss Abby is going to be our picker for all of the drawings over here. Yeah, you want to yeah. come over here, Miss Abby? You want to come over here with me? All right. I want you to go ahead and let's pick one of these. Which one do you think? You want to go with that one first? All right. What is that name? That's going to be Thomas Buchanan. All right, good job. Sweet. Those are the most comfortable hats ever. They're the best. All right, you want to choose another one for me? Can you color all the colors? Oh, we have a Wyatt Polk here. Oh, is that her brother? Oh, good job. Good job, Wyatt. That's it's rigged. Good. <laughs> nice. Very sweet. He's got a rodeo shirt on too. Did you see I that? I like it. All right. You want to pick another one for me? This one? This is going to be Alan Turner. All right. Good job. Awesome. Very cool. All right. You those because those would hurt somebody. Yeah, I'm throwing the jigs. You're just going to throw them? <laughs> oh, oh, we're going to switch to the These jigs now? These are my now? secret weapons. Oh, we got one more hat. One more hat. All right. Which one do you think? This one? Who is that? Oh. Michael Prowse? Did I pronounce that correctly or did I kill it? 
first catch. All right. So next one. This one will be a jig. Which one do you think? That one? This is Philip. I uh, can't. I Philip. Know, can't. All right, I there you go. <laughs> your, your choice. I'll take the pink one. I guess. Yeah, there okay, you go. there you go. All right, so the last one. Let's put a little extra good luck juju on this one, okay? All right, which one do you think? Like Vanna White. <laughs> this one? James Scott. I like the XO, XO, XO. Go ahead and do another one. I'll let somebody else. Are you sure? I'm sure. Aw, thank you. That I love. See, he's, he gave us this stuff. I like that. Uh, we will. We always owe you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Want to do one more? This one? Okay. Ted Fuller. Yeah. Woo! Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Everybody thank Miss Abby. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. So uh, next month's seminar will be um, inshore fishing and I'm sure